This is the Cities Podcast. I'm Brianna Goldberg. I'm standing in front of 401 Richmond, near Spadina, in downtown Toronto. It's an area of town where the financial district starts melting into the fashion district. One of those transitional spaces where money meets design. Lots of architecture offices around here, some nightclubs, lots of shiny condos going up. And then there's 401 Richmond. I first came to this building about a decade ago. I was reporting on a story about the Inside Out Film Festival, its offices upstairs. I remember being excited by the feel of this space. It's historic and industrial, artistic and modern at the same time, and so full of light. 401 Richmond started out in the early 1900s as a factory, but it declined over the years. It was set for the wrecking ball in the mid-90s until Margie Zeidler saved the day with a plan to transform it into a mixed-use building with a focus on the arts. Zeidler studied at U of T's Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design, celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. She's just one of the alumni whose work is reshaping Toronto. Zeidler has been the force behind the Gladstone Hotel revitalization, the Center for Social Innovation, Jane's Walks. She's always opening new doors. Later in the podcast, you'll get a sneak peek into Doors Open Toronto, happening May 23rd and 24th. It's a festival of exploration where more than 155 spaces open their doors to anyone curious to learn more. As part of this, the University of Toronto is sponsoring 14 free walking tours throughout various areas of the city. So stick around to find out how you might be able to score an extra special takeaway at Doors Open Toronto. First though, the doors opened by Zeidler's vision for 401 Richmond. An innovative, affordable space fostering galleries, startups, NGOs, and headquarters of indie film festivals. But I nearly lost my life getting there. Traffic rushes through the Richmond Corridor at terrifying speeds. It never had proper sidewalks or bike lanes. I remember shimmying along the side of the building to avoid getting flattened by cars speeding by. So, since then I've avoided it. When walking across the city I'll take a different route, or at the very least hurry through without bothering to look around. I'm not the only one. 401 Richmond has remained this island of cool stuff surrounded by pedestrian danger on every side. Then, Shauna Braille asked me to join her class there for an afternoon. Thank you for being here and on time, and we're very fortunate to go on a tour around the area. Think back, you know, a couple hundred years ago, this was the manufacturing center of Canada. We are close to the railway lines, we're close to the waterfront, and this area has undergone an enormous transformation in the last even just actually the last almost 20 years from what it was when we were sort of hewers of wood and drawers of water to a very advanced knowledge economy. So let's go inside. Brielle calls on her background in planning and geography as she teaches the Urban Studies program at U of T's Innes College. She works with students on issues of community leadership, built environments, city planning, transit, these kinds of things. But on top of their research and discussions about the forces that change the city, they also get out into it. The program opens doors to positions with community groups, urban organizations, city councillors offices. It's all part of their coursework. Heads up, it was a big group and I couldn't always get my mic in front of them in time, so you might have to listen closely in a few parts. I'm doing my placement at the Office of Councillor Bylaw. Kevin, uh, City Hall with uh, Councillor Joe Mahip. Uh, North Shaddy, I'm with the Center for Social Innovation. And with Friends of the Pan Path. Flora with Park People. The class also visits important hubs in the city. Every year, Braille brings her students to 401 Richmond to hear its story of transformation and to watch it change. And then, afterwards, they do a little walk around the neighborhood. If you can call it a neighborhood, because as I said, I knew it as a traffic-heavy transitional space. Closest to the sort of downtown core, it's got the location, it's got good building spaces, there's anticipated to be something like 50,000 employees and 35,000 new residents based on the development proposals, applications, submissions, things that are approved. So let's go east and see what's happening there. That's also the area where all of the nightclubs have been. There's something like nightclub capacity of 43,000 people. That was in 2005. I think that's declined since then, but I didn't. I haven't actually seen a lot of material on nightclub issues in the area recently, but let's walk this way. Now there are high rises full of people who call this area home. Things are changing, and it's time I paid attention, time we paid attention. Braille invited me to join her students as they explored the area, to see it through their eyes. 
was one of those rare calls to wake up and see the city growing around you. Braille opened the door and all I had to do was walk through onto the slick new sidewalk. So this hole, where this sidewalk is new, there used to be just a concrete barrier here. And I remember taking a class and in some places there was a barrier and in some places there wasn't. So you're actually practically in the road. So this is something that represents a significant improvement in this area. Thank goodness for that. So we walked safely around the neighborhood, and for the first time in years, I actually looked at it. The students had a more specific focus. Some were tasked with keeping an eye for green spaces, others built form or transit. And after our stroll, we regrouped at the corner of King and Spadina, and everything I'd been blind to for the past 10 years came into view. Okay, public realm. Okay. Um, we felt that the sidewalks were still pretty congested, but there were on the other street trees that had protection so that was good. It's still really dominated by cars around here like there's so many surface parking lots still and the streets are really wide so there's a lot of parked cars and a lot of moving cars it doesn't really feel like a pedestrian valued. All right good yeah. architecture. We noticed a building that had like four floors of like the heritage side on the bottom and then the apartment on the top. I'm not a big fan of it I don't really like it but I think it's just evidence of like the area is changing and you're not a fan in the sense that you don't like the way it looks it's not visually appealing or it doesn't meet the sort of intent of the original guidelines in terms of the reuse yeah I think it's better to just conserve the entire site rather than building the new site on okay um, we felt that the mix of architecture in the area is definitely great um, the mix of the heritage buildings and the some of the redevelopments have an interesting juxtaposition between how the architecture of the area is developing but we felt that uh, some of the new, newer architecture kind of takes away from the focus because it's a bit homogenous in the way it looks. Good, thank you. Okay, transit. Oh, let's hear from the transit folks. We highlighted the existence of the bike lanes, but at the same time we made an observation that they're not really like well separated and they have like often just a few poles so they're just like in transition from being an actual part of the road to actually becoming a full-fledged bike lane. And um, yeah, we also discussed that the King Street car is massively overcrowded and it's not very like efficient, but it's there, so. Okay. Any other transit? It's like abandoned old tracks here on Adelaide, I guess. Potential maybe for you. Not sure if you heard that. He mentioned abandoned streetcar tracks on Adelaide. I had never noticed those before. When I got back to the office, I started searching online and discovered a whole body of literature about Toronto's transit ghosts. Lines long since abandoned on Mount Pleasant and Rogers Road and Adelaide. Then another student pointed out that in this industrial area of traffic and concrete, there is greenery around. It's just hiding. There's a lot of public parking areas, but I do know that some of these buildings have green roofs, so that could count. Like, I think that building has something like green roof, but... So, okay, still mostly parking lots, but also green roofs. Life can flourish here both above and amongst the flow of traffic. How was our last field trip? Amazing. <laughs> uh, fantastic. <laughs> yes. Okay, what didn't you like about it? I'm sure it Yeah. I'm not actually looking for like a... <laughs> okay, fine, it was fantastic. Okay. And if you would like to see more layers of the city around you, then pull out your calendar and mark down May 23rd and 24th. Those are the dates for Doors Open Toronto. The annual event is set to take over 155 buildings in Toronto. As part of this, the University of Toronto is sponsoring 14 free walking tours throughout various areas of the city. One is all about where art meets nature in Guild Park. Another is about the Islington neighborhood's murals. There's one on intersecting highways of Toronto's indigenous history, neighborhood movie theaters, tours of the downtown towers, the waterfront, Fort York, and then there are two that show off some of the hidden histories at the University of Toronto. At the Scarborough campus, it's a tour of ravine lands that double as a wildlife corridor. And at St. George campus, you can learn about the past century in sports, leisure, and recreation. Besides the Gothic architecture at Hart House and other historical tidbits, the tour wraps up at a very new and state-of-the-art Goldring Center for High Performance Sport. Now, here's your insider tip. Register for that walking tour early. The better your chances of scoring a free pedometer to help you count your steps during doors open and every day after that, 
To register, just head to utoronto.ca and click the Doors Open Toronto banner on the homepage. We'll also link to it wherever you can find this podcast online. Pass this tip along to your friends by sharing the podcast. You can just copy the link and post it on your Facebook. You can email it. You can just plain tell someone. Please do, because the more people we invite into the city's podcast, the more we can tell the stories of your city. Tweet with the hashtag U of T Cities or send me an email at U of T News at utoronto.ca. Tell me who and what you'd like to hear more about in this show. Tell me about the walking routes and secret corners of the city that you love. More than likely, I'll end up using them in an episode like this one. Hi, my name is Hiba Masood, and one of my favorite places in Toronto is the Rosedale Ravine near Young and St. Clair. I love going down there because it's so peaceful and secluded and a really nice place to get away from the busy city. Thanks, Hiba. Hiba just wrapped up her first year at U of T, where she took a course on citizenship in the Canadian city, taught by urban columnist Sean McAuliffe, one of those courses that got them out in the city doing things too, part of the UC1 program. You can hear more about that and from McAuliffe in one of our back episodes of the podcast. Music you heard in this episode comes from Jazafari, found on the Free Music Archive, and from Jay Ferguson, who wrote and performed it especially for us, so thanks to Jay. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or follow us on SoundCloud to get new episodes as soon as they're ready. For example, you'll get the one I'm so excited to share with you where I sit down with Toronto's Poet Laureate, George Elliott Clark. That's coming up on the City's Podcast. This series is produced by me, Brianna Goldberg, with help from U of T News Editor, Jennifer Lantier. Thanks for listening.